Hi, and welcome again to Microeconomics. This chapter uh, in your course is on another microeconomics field, and it is uh, the field of information economics. Information economics developed as an alternative explanation, uh, again, of the rational economic agent assumption in the classical utility maximization story models of uh, of economics that you studied uh, in an earlier chapter, Carlin and Murdoch chapter seven. So economic consumer behavior, game theory are two alternatives to uh, alternative branches of microeconomics that take on the effort to explain what is, uh, uh, what are alternative ways of thinking about rational economic agents when the data do not bear out that people behave in what we call the traditional classical way of uh, the uh, utility maximization model. So this other approach is a little bit older than game theory and it's a little bit older than applying cognitive bias uh, in behavior, the psychological model behind the consumer behavior branch, consumer uh, behavioral economics branch. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this branch of economics actually made its, uh, its, has its origins in the insurance industry where the classical insurance problem is where we began observing behavior uh, that was not uh, per the classical rational economic agent. And the best way to rationalize the behavior at the time was through what was called the asymmetries in information, which lead to two kinds of departures from the rational economic agent. One happening before information is exchanged between two parties and one happening after information is exchanged between two parties. So the first one is called adverse selection and the second one is called moral hazard. What are adverse selection and moral hazard? Adverse selection is the observed process when buyers and sellers have different information sets about a situation and as a result uh, buyers or sellers end up with uh, either suppliers or with customers uh, whose assessments of quality or riskiness of a situation are different than the ones that were expected prior to the transaction being a deal or engaged. Example, uh, an insurance company launches a healthcare product, a health insurance product, where uh, if you get sick, you can go visit a doctor. And uh, it has a copay, let's say it's a $30 copay. When you go visit the doctor, you pay $30. And every other aspect of the service of the visit is covered by this health plan. The plan comes with another feature, and the feature is that uh, if you are ill, uh, the plan will cover 80% uh, of all medication costs, and you have to cover out of pocket 20% of the medication costs. A particular person learns of this plan and knows that there are no other conditions than the ones I've just laid out. And this person happens to know that in their family, there's a history of cancer, uh, cancer that happens uh, suddenly at any point in time. So this person buys the insurance product and upon going to their first or second uh, appointment for a checkup, they discover that they have cancer and the insurance company then covers all the bills, even though this person is brand new to that plan. Um, except for the 20% on the medications, of course, and the $30 of copay per visit. But that's a lot less than paying for 100% of the whole treatment out of pocket. Now, this person who engaged the insurance company knew ahead of time that they were likelier to befall victimhood to uh, cancer of some sort. But uh, 
the insurance company did not have that information. So that information asymmetry is an example of adverse selection. And you can see why it's called adverse selection because the insurance company was unable to screen the kinds of people that they wanted to sell this product. And as a result, the kinds of people who want to buy the product are different than the general population. They are more sick than the usual or general population. Moral hazard is slightly different. Moral hazard is a condition by which consumers or producers who engage in this behavior in moral hazard are essentially changing their behavior as customers after they buy a product or service. So for example, you decide that you're gonna buy a new car. So you go buy the car and you love cars. You take care of cars, you're an awesome provider of care for cars. The car that you buy comes with an all-inclusive warranty for the first 50,000 miles of the car's life. Anything that goes wrong with the car, at no cost to you, the dealer where you picked up the car will take the car, give you a loaner, and take care of whatever problem exists with the car. What does that sort of a warranty do to the behavior of a buyer, even a buyer who loves cars and who is very gentle and takes care of cars really well? The likely situation of moral hazard then occurs in that because the car is fully insured, the person doesn't have to be as careful with the automobile as they would before they had an auto with a warranty. So they're gonna to behave totally differently with respect to a car where anything that can go wrong gets repaired by the dealer versus a car where anything that goes wrong comes out of their pocket. So they're super careful with a car that they own and super careless with a car that is fully warranted. And that is an explanation of moral hazard. So moral hazard is some uh, change in behavior that occurs after the fact, whereas adverse selection is a kind of behavior that occurs before the fact of the transaction of a good or service. It tends to happen a lot in the case of warranties and in the case of insurance products and services. Now, another situation that in economics uh, we tend to ignore uh, are situations that tend to be more complex than just a buyer and a seller. And they refer to a problem of principal agency. So a principal is a person who is engaged in buying or selling. And an agent is a person who works on behalf of the buyer or seller. So a principal, for example, might be a baseball athlete, a superstar. So you have a principal, and then um, you have their agent. And their agent is the person who acts on behalf of them. And then you have the second party to the transaction or the other party to the transaction. But why would a person like a principal not want to simply directly engage with the other party? Well, that's what tends to happen in economic transactions in a market. So that's very descriptive of uh, market economic transactions. Where we assume complete and full information on the part of both parties of the transaction. So they really don't need an agent because they have access to information that creates a balance of knowledge and not an asymmetric information that leads to uh, one party or the other having an edge in the negotiating of transactions. So full and complete information is what makes markets function without the needs of agents. 
In other situations, agents are necessary because we have asymmetries in information. And so the principal contracts with the agent such that they form a bond, a bond that is uh, solidified by the principal typically paying the agent for representation. And then the agent is the one engaging in the direct transaction to the other party. And essentially negotiates for the principal. And that's because the agent tends to possess information that perhaps the principal is not privy to. So it happens a lot in professional sports where professional athletes are so intensely focused on being the best athlete in their field or career. Professional actors are so engaged in their acting trade that for them, looking at contracts and looking at how contracts work and all different clauses and all the different uh, dates of service and this and that, it's just too much, too time consuming for them to know all that stuff and still be great superstars in a sports arena or on a uh, film set or on a uh, acting stage of some sort or some performance uh, uh, based activity like uh, like bands also have agents that represent them in in their financial and monetary interests and these agents tend to be uh, highly specialized and highly knowledgeable people in in what uh, what what kinds of clauses to engage and what kinds of clauses not to engage in so in exchange for money the agent gives the principal uh, peace of mind that uh, trust, privacy, private information, uh, access, uh, things that enable the agent to represent the principal as if they were the principal. Of course, some of these are subject to risks and because the agent might not know certain things or, or situations might change and the agent might not be aware of those changes and cannot represent the principal fully. Or you might also develop further distance between the agent and the other party and how they transact. The agent might become, over time, not keep up with the industry knowledge and become uh, toxic to the principal and to the other party. And so there are a lot of problems that, uh, in a, that, that are caused by asymmetries in information and the agent's job is to bridge, to gap, to bridge this gap and to create a solid uh, foundation to uh, transactions occurring outside of the market mechanism. Um, and that's what a principal agent uh, problem is. It does not mean that moral hazard or that adverse selection is impossible. It's still very much possible. Uh, boxing is infamous for having uh, a lot of adverse selection in the principal agent designations. The, a lot of boxing promoters uh, tend to have a really bad reputation with boxers who are nearing the end of their careers where they are preyed upon financially as well as uh, put uh, into a ring with younger athletes who uh, tend to accelerate the, their decay as athletes, if not take them completely out of the sport. So what kinds of mechanisms do these uh, information uh, types of processes engage in to provide these types of solutions of peace of mind and tranquility and restoring symmetry and information. And the answer is uh, primarily it's screening and signaling uh, strategies. Uh, a signaling strategy, for example, is like, like when you dress up to go out to a wedding. Why do you dress up? You might dress up to signal your regard for the people who are getting married. Uh, 
Uh, so that would be a signaling tool. What is a screening tool? Your resume. When you build a resume to look for a job, the resume has information that makes it easier for the people who are hiring to know that you qualify, you're qualified to do the work that they are seeking to employ somebody for. Uh, reputation is also an important third party principal agent st structure. So Yelp is an agent in the principal agent game of establishing the reputation of a restaurant and its quality with respect to its service. But uh, as Yelp has uh, tools that allow people to post stuff, the things that people post can be false. And it's not always the case that Yelp can correct false information traveling through its site. The same can be said of information in social media sites that don't have any liability or requirement to fact check or to provide truth. They might actually fact check something as false when it's true. They might actually not screen something that is actually false and promote falsehoods that way. So uh, there are issues with reputation games and with uh, societies like ours that have a ton of information such that we end up with an overload of a lot of fake stories or stories that are not deemed fake but are and or rewritings of past events or history uh, to accommodate worldviews that are perhaps uh, trying to compete for the status quo. Uh, you also have what's called uh, statistical discrimination, which is a misuse of information to try to create generalizations uh, and fill the void of missing information with generalizing based on data that is not necessarily uh, verifiably representative of an overall reality. And so statistical discrimination can occur whenever the samples of data used to create statistical uh, statements on social media, on newspapers, or on any other uh, screening or signaling or reputation mechanism uh, could be misinformation rather than information. And uh, the role of government becomes really important because government then uh, has to play the role of a, an unbiased third party uh, judge that essentially weighs and validates information coming into from all parties engaged in the transaction, trying to resolve uh, problems that can occur from moral hazard or adverse selection in either simple uh, buyer-seller transactions or principal agent third-party transactions. I hope this was a great summary of your chapter 10 and that it enables you to complete exam three in chapters 10 lab and quiz. More importantly, I thought, I think that, that I hope that uh, these brief introductions to extensions to the classical utility maximization theory help you understand that these tools from the late 19th and early 20th century haven't been static. Uh, people, uh, academics, intellectuals, philosophers have been working in many, many different directions to try to explain discrepancies between these older uh, models of consumer behavior and individual behavior, economic behavior or agent behavior uh, to make better predictions about how people actually engage in economic transactions as either buyers, sellers, negotiators, auctioneers or bargainers. And uh, I hope this video contributes to your curiosity in expanding your interest in the field of economics. Have a good one.